So welcome everyone. My name is Anthony Ryder. I'm a senior outreach coordinator at Green Thumb. Uh, we are the division of the Parks Department that works with community gardens across the city. Uh, I just would like to give a huge thank you to Cindy for um, facilitating this workshop and for agreeing to do it. This was originally planned to be in the Liz Christie Community Garden um, in the East Village, and we were able to make this um, a virtual workshop while we all have to stay home. Um, so Cindy is a Brooklyn-based landscape and garden designer with an eye for the beauty of nature. Her experience ranges from estate garden design to ecological restoration and studies in ecology and permaculture. Often called upon to deal with ecologically degraded sites, she designs, installs, manages, and advises on educational and community gardens and residential properties. She gives workshops and trainings for people who like to garden. Um, also, Cindy is a community gardener, uh, so we're super happy to have her leading this workshop. So, Cindy, it's all yours. Hey, thank you very much, Anthony. Hello, everybody. Wonderful to be here with you. Um, let's get right into it. When people think about herbaceous perennials, uh, there's usually the colorful flowering plants that they have in mind, um, but there are others, the ferns and the grasses that are equally as beautiful and as useful. Um, and uh, so let's get into them today. Um, one thing that people seem to think that all ferns look alike, and it's true, a lot of them are very similar, and same with grasses very hard to tell them apart. Um, but I'm hoping today to give you enough of an introduction that uh, not only to begin to tell them apart, but to be able to select the ones that will do best in your garden and to appreciate how amazing they truly are. Uh, the key word to the title of this talk is introduction. Uh, we have a wide range of city condition, city gardening conditions, and I'm Putting the, putting the talk together with those conditions in mind uh, and show which ferns and grasses are suited to which conditions. But uh, it's just the beginning. There are many, many more species and uh, there's only so much we can do in an hour. Okay, so um, before we begin, I just wanna ask you too to be thinking about uh, the conditions of your garden because that's what we're dealing with in this talk. Uh, the light conditions. Uh, you may have a little bit of sun, a little bit of shade, mixed, all kinds of conditions, or maybe just one. Uh, the soil, the texture, the, the uh, how rich it is. Is it compacted? Uh, soil moisture is very important. How how well does it hold moisture or dry dry out? Um, and by the way, in the handout you have when there's a, a category for moisture, that's soil moisture that has nothing to do with irrigation or water. How much water does soil hold? All right, so let's start with the ferns and I'm going to um, Hold on, full screen. Okay. There we are. So let's start with the ferns. Uh, ferns are ancient plants. They're, they're older than to the flower than the flowering plants that we know of. Also of the tropical. Or somebody else's mic. Okay. Um, this picture was taken in Puerto Rico in the uh, rainforest. I'm told that Costa Rica has 800 fern species. That's a lot more than we do. And also they have um, this one. That's the tree fern. Tree ferns can grow 30 feet. We don't have any of those here. Okay. 
the um, distribution of, of uh, ferns is, is, is interesting because, you know, when we talk about native plants, um, we think that, that the plants that are native to our region, there might be native to regions, na neighboring regions, some of them one way or another, but what's native here is not going to be native on the West Coast, for example. However, with ferns, it's a totally different thing. And this has a lot to do with their age on the planet. Um, the same ferns, some of the ferns that are native here are also native in parts of Asia and Europe. In other words, Northern Hemisphere. Um, so it's a whole different thing uh, to be talking about than, than the native issues that we've been so um, focused on for here. Um, um, ferns are in a separate category from flowering plants. They are different phyla. They have no flowers. They do not reproduce by seed. They are more closely related to mosses. Give a little, uh, tell you a little bit about how what ferns are uh, about. We're going any into the ferns themselves. As I said, no flowers. Ferns have a two-phase cycle of reproduction. The fern that we see, the plant that we see, is the sporophyte, and it produce. It means plant producing spores. It produces spores that, when dispersed, grow into the other generation, which is called gametophyte. Okay, these are not spores. These are sori. Sori contain the clusters of sporangia, which contain the spores. And they're about, I'm told there's 64, sometimes 64 spores in a sporangia. So you can imagine how many spores you're looking at right now. When those spores get dispersed and go out in the ground, they grow into the gametophyte. And you're looking at something in a, in a greenhouse setting. It's very hard to see these on the ground. And they, I'm told by experts that are hardly ever seen in a garden setting. So this, the gametophyte makes the sexual cells that produce the fertilized eggs that grow into the sporophytes, the plant we know. Parts of the fern, I'm not gonna focus, get too heavy into this, but the leaf is called the frond. The new, the new leaf is called the fiddlehead. Two other important terms one is pinna, that's like a leaflet, just showing you this. Just to show you, this is how the way different kinds of ferns are described in terms of how many, uh, how many leaflets of leaflets of leaflets and, and what shape they are. The other important piece of the fern is the rhizome. You'll see that the, both the, the shoots and the roots grow from it. The form of the fern is dictated by the rhizome. A vertical and crown forming rhizome lead to bay shaped ferns. Horizontal rhizomes that are short and tight may lead to dense ferns. If they're long and spacious, you got a wide spreading fern. Okay, ferns for city gardens. Um, when you look up ferns in, in books and in online and in catalogs, you see most of them say, therefore, uh, shady, moist, humusy rich soil is what you need. Well, that's not going to help us much, um, especially if we don't have the humusy rich soil. Well, we can, that's easy. We can't make humus. It's a, it, that takes a long time. But we can you make um, add compost and organic matter to have a good rich soil. And most of them, most of them will need that. Um, as far as the shade, well, the, the shade in the city, you know, when you got buildings in, in there as well as, as trees, it's very different from a country setting. So we have to talk about shade in a little different way. And same with moisture. Um, uh, mo most true, most, most ferns do require a good deal of moisture. But what I'm going to try to do in this talk is point out which need more or less. And the, the other thing too is very simple rule. If you're going to have, if you're going to put them in a sunnier spot, they're going to need more moisture than if you have them in a semi-shady or deep shade. 
and and if you've got a very very dry garden and no moisture at all well the other half of this talk is about grasses and they can have drought as well as dry conditions generally so i'm categorizing our turns in this way in terms of how we use what's important to us in the city. First, the aggressive colonizers, then the well-behaved and easily managed turns for gardens, then the plants that serve background and foundation plantings, and finally some small ones. Okay, we're starting with the aggressive, starting with hay-scented turns. Um, this is not for gardens. This is for an area that if you need to cover the ground and uh, just have it there reliably, hay scented fern will do it. There are a couple other ferns that are the same. Bracken fern and uh, New York fern uh, can get very uh, ready like this too. The top picture, of course, is the, is the, uh, the fern close up. Uh, the bottom right is, is is hay scented ferns spread throughout a, a woodland. And the reason I'm including the picture of the bear who knocked down the uh, bird feeder on the lawn is because the top half of the picture beyond the is all hay scented fern put in by the uh, previous owner of this property. And up on a slope, it will be removed and replaced with all kinds of things, but you see how dense it gets. Another, another aggressive plant, another um, is um, sensitive fern. You see how beautiful it is over in the top left and in the center, it's very coarse. Um, but um, bottom left shows how it, the, it took over the backyard of a Brooklyn garden at with Paul's honeysuckle and uh, porcelain vine that's all being taken down and the sensitive fern is in the front of it. But this plant, if you keep it in a contained situation, it does fine, so as in over on the lower right. Uh, one other thing I want to point out here is that if those fronds in the upper right, um, ferns, as we said, they have sorry, uh, but in some cases, the ferns are what's called dimorphic. In other words, only some of the ferns will have the will be fertile, will have the sorry spores, and the others will be vegetated. And very often, those fertile fronds um, will linger uh, into the fall, and that's what you're looking at now: upright fertile fronds of the sensitive fern. Some of the other Ferns we're talking, we'll see, we'll have, we'll have, or will be dimorphic and have fur. Okay, now we're getting into the more manageable plants, um, starting with lady fern. Um, it, one thing about this, this plant is, is circumglobal. It's all, it's all over Asia and, and Europe as well. Um, What's nice about this one is that it tolerates drier soil than most, most other uh, ferns. And it's a clump former. It's not going to spread drastically. But look, it makes a nice, uh, it, a nice um, ground cover if you want it, too. Uh, actually, I have seen it uh, get somewhat aggressive in some woodland settings, but they're not going to get aggressive in your um, if you put it in full sun, you're going to have to keep it in full sun. Now, like so many other plants, lady fern has cultivars. Um, over in the, some of these were, de well, the one on the top left, Roselii, was developed during the fern craze of the Victorian era. Ghost is a relatively new one. You can see how white it is. But the, the big one now that's almost replacing all the other, even the, even the straight species, is lady in red with the red stems. You get that very readily. 
here's the front around here. So these are two that I particularly like. Uh, Minutissima is, is a smaller one and very uh, useful in a, in a city garden. Um, the, these, these spiky leaves are the, the ends of daffodils. So uh, you get an idea of how small it is. And that's a foam flower in the back. That's what that's blooming now. Um, and the other one, Branford's Rambler, it, it, it does spread. Uh, but it's very low and it's very slow to spread. So it's a very nice filler uh, among uh, shrubs, uh, but also even among perennials. Next one, maidenhair fern. Makes a very nice ground cover, as you can see, or as a beautiful specimen. It spreads slowly. The, the rhizomes are short. Um, and uh, so it's met quite manageable in a garden. And there's a dwarf form of this too. That's just among the rock. Those are little rocks <laughs> that this among with it. Um, and one thing nice about this is you think most ferns and, and many plants, native plants, they like a low pH soil. This can handle a high pH. Marginal shield fern, very, um, it's just a beautiful fern. I hope you're getting the differences between these, uh, these pictures, I hope do it justice. Uh, plant is, you know, it's a, it's a clumper and it's very slow to spread, uh, very well behaved, beautiful among perennials. In itself, I'm showing you the sorry. Uh, you see how they're on the edges of the pinna. There, there. Um, that's why it's called marginalis. Christmas fern. It's called Christmas fern because it is in fact visible at Christmas time. In the lower left, that white stuff is snow. I'm sorry, the lower right. Um, and um, the plant does flatten out at, at that time of year. And then, of course, it sends up new shoots in the spring. Uh, on the top right is where it's used as a um, boundary along a path at New York Botanical Garden. And it's, this plant can tolerate a lot. It does fine in poor soils. and. and but it is drought tolerant and, and dependable in that way. I couldn't help but include this one, which is not native, obviously, uh, but a beautiful plant that just is a reminder that there are others that we can use. This is one of them. Uh, Japanese autumn fern. Over in the top left is the new shoots coming up. And they do, they do are that color when they come up, not just in the not just in the fall, but in the spring, a little lighter. Beautiful plant. Uh, and I I've got it growing right next to a very uh, shallow rooted tree, and it's doing fine under you know, with rocks. If you put rocks around a plant, that will direct the water into it. I mean, do it, do it, make it look natural. Um, that will direct the water as it falls toward the roots of that plant, and it helps with, with in a situation like that. To have the water. Now we're going to move on to. These are the plants that serve as foundation plantings or back. Ostrich fern is the one that has the edible fiddleheads. You can eat ferns on it, this plant. You'll see the how it's a tall plant uh, in the vase shape. It does spread, however. And by the way, over on the right, that's the fertile frond from the previous year. As the new fronds are coming up. Um, you see the spreading on the lower left. Uh, I was thinking about 
putting it up next to a building or any of these in, in the city, it might, you're gonna to have to augment the soil with, with uh, compost, et cetera. Um, chances are the soil is not good and, and you want it to retain moisture. But then if you're gonna want the moisture, then probably you should put some kind of a shield, maybe a plastic shield uh, against the building so that it doesn't get, especially with neighbor's building, uh, so it doesn't get, get the moisture. So that's, but, but then again, I, but then again, this could be a, a, a boundary along a path or a, a side of a garden. Doesn't have to be. Another one of the issues of beauty, cinnamon fern, so called because the fertile fronds, I don't know if they're right or fertile, it's like one of the sticks. Over on the left is coming up new at Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. A few weeks ago, down at the bottom, that's the color you get in the fall. So there's a lot of show in there. Royal fern is related, they're like the end of it, but it has a much more coarse leaf. The two have um, fall foliage, that's the new growth in the spring. And that's The, uh, the name Osmunda sounds familiar. The fibrous roots of these plants are used as the potting material for orchids. Goldie's wood fern. If you have, if you want a large, tall plant, you're afraid of getting it to spread. You're afraid it will spread then go for this one. It's the most uh, garden worthy of all the large plants. It uh, doesn't, and it doesn't like wet soil. It tolerate dry soil. And for that reason, you can use it, I would say use it not only as a foundation plant, but as a, as a, as a specimen in the garden, stand out among lower growing plants. These are plants that literally grow in between rocks or in little pockets in rock. Ebony spleenwort, um, you can grow it in the ground, but you gotta make a very gritty, uh, well-drained soil. It's humusy. Um, this plant will tolerate some drought and um, stay visible all winter. You can see it. Think of it as putting in a stone wall or a brick wall, or even if you have some natural stone with some pockets, you can tuck it in there. Hairy lip fern um, has to be kept cool. So the roots have to be kept cool. So you need a deeper pocket or a deeper place or a deeper or a heavier rock for it to, to grow next to. These are tiny. So you can imagine a, a, a wall with, you'll see these in, in nature. In, these are, uh, and I've seen some um, on a wall going down toward Brooklyn Bridge Park. They came up on one. Lastly, this one, beautiful brown cover, very small, and beautiful. Imagine other plants coming up through it. Okay, I'm going to stop there and uh, see if anybody's got any questions on the ferns or anything else we've talked about so far. All right, we got a good number of questions while you were speaking, so I will um, start with the first one I have, and then we'll go from there. How many? Do so, you have, just for the sake of understanding, how much time we have? Yeah. How many? Do you uh, have? There's there's about seven. Some are quick. Okay. answers. Um, so the first is, I have a miscanthus that I purchased in the fall of 2019. 
and brought the plant indoors during the winter, thinking that I could grow it indoors. Upon further research, it appears the miscanthus requires chill time. At this point, I put the pot outside and have seen no growth in over two months. How will I know if the plant is viable? Um, well, you can look at the just dig, look at the rhizome and the roots first of all. Um, I don't grow miscanthus, I must tell you, because it does get uh, does spread into our. It's not native, and it does spread into our natural areas. It's beautiful, but I grew it at one time. Um, I, don't, I can't tell you um, how I've never grown it in a pot. And yes, it does not, it does require being outside. If you want to keep it in a pot, maybe put it in a cool, a place that's somewhat protected over the winter. That. Great. Um, are all fern shoots edible as fiddleheads, or are only some varieties edible? A very good question. The, the only one that's really uh, palatable is the uh, ostrich fern. The others, I mean, if you were in the woods and, and hadn't eaten for days, you know, you could eat others, but they're not really recommended. Uh, I haven't checked, but maybe some of them might have some toxins in them too. I don't know. That's great. Um, is I think this question is, is the ghost fern bicolor with some reddish color in the fronds? Well, it does have a, yeah, it's not all white. It does have some, uh, it does have a little red and a little green in it. Great. It's very, very upright. Uh, one, one reading I had was that uh, uh, the reason it's called ghost is because of its form more than its color. Get that, but that's why. I don't know. Um, are there ferns that are good in and around rain gardens? Oh, very good question. Yes. Um, uh, yes, definitely. Uh, you know, they like moisture. So at different stages, if you can see me, I'm, I'm you're not seeing me, but I'm, a rain garden has different levels going down into the moister areas to the drier areas up. Um, and ferns definitely uh, work in those, uh, depending on how large. Uh, the rain garden is, uh, it's, it has a lot to do with what size plant you're growing and how, and how aggressive it is. But yes, ferns can definitely be used in the rain garden. We'll talk about that another time. Great. Mm. Um, this person is concerned about planting in a formerly barren, shady area and drawing rats that will create burrows there. Is this a valid concern? How can they mitigate this from happening? That's a very good question. Um, it is a problem. Um, there's no real solution because from what I've learned of rats, uh, they, they like something they can crawl under. And a lot of these ferns are just perfect for that. Uh, if it's really flat, you don't have a problem. Or if it's really tall and vase-shaped, you don't have a problem. But a lot of the ferns, uh, like the lady fern and the marginal shield, are going to be a problem. I'm going to bring this up here. Um, the question, we remember that um, ferns do not have flowers. They don't have, uh, no, they don't have, they don't have seeds and they don't have reason to attract pollinators. Uh, and so with all the talk about ecological value of plants and pollinators and all that, of course, well, well, what, could, what could the ecological purposes of ferns be? And I came up with these. Um, and uh, one of them, the, the second from the bottom, is microhabitats and shelter for small animals, including some we don't like. Um, but um, so that's, that's the issue there. Uh, uh, but let's go through these others while we're here. They definitely are a colonizer. Uh, for a disturbed site. It's one of its early stages of, of, uh, of succession. Um, the plants uh, will just be colonized. Some, not all of them, but, some, but many of them will. We saw the aggressive ones, certainly. They fill unique niches in the ecosystem. These are the small plants that we looked at. They will co-evolve with endemic species. Some will filter toxins. Have to look 
you know, if, you, if you're going to eat, you, you be aware of that. I mentioned the, the uh, small animals, and they can be food and medicine for animals and food and people. Um, so, uh, any other questions? All right. So, the next question is. Are there any evergreen ferns that grow in our area? Well, yes, the, um, the Christmas fern is evergreen. The marginal shield fern is evergreen. Um, what happens is, you know, even if evergreen trees, they, they lose their leaves at some point, but, but they, uh, they, the uh, evergreenness is just the, the uh, lingering of, this, of these ponds over the winter without turning brown. And, uh, and then you get the new growth in the spring on top of that. Um, I think there are a few yeah. others. It's on your on your handout. Uh, you'll see there's a few others. I'm trying to remember. Great. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? The next one is, uh, what ferns would grow well under black walnut trees? Oh, that's a very good question. You know what? Um, when I was studying this, I. I left that thought out. Um, get in touch with me later. I'll look it up and see. But yeah, some of them, uh, there are some that can handle uh, the black walnut. Great. Questions are still coming in while we're talking. So <laughs> I'm trying to ca capture them. Just a couple more. And, and then we better right. move to the rest at the end. Yes. Um, what soil conditions are best for the Christmas fern growing in a container? In a container, well, um, the, um, the container is a, is a problem. Um, um, It needs the drainage. Uh, you have to make sure the soil is, you know, the water will go through. That's very important. Uh, if you're going to have it outside in winter, again, possibly, um, possibly uh, put it in a, a slightly warmer spot over the winter, depending on how big the pot is, or bury the whole pot. That's the thing to do. Bury the whole pot in the ground somewhere if you can. Um, I'm gathering though that people are talking about pots and maybe they're talking about windowsills. Is that the issue or? Um, um, people haven't specified, so I would assume it maybe is like backyards or windowsills. Yeah, but any if you the, the way to overwinter any of these guys because they do require winter. Uh, if they're in a pot, is to heal them in or or put them in a put the whole pot in the ground. Uh, for the winter and then dig out the pot in the spring. Why don't we move on to the um, grasses and then we can come back for other questions. Great. Sorry, we have to do that. Grasses. I'm including sedges and rushes with grasses. If you look in any catalog online in the nursery, uh, they're always, the, the, the grasses uh, chapter always has sedges and rushes in it. Uh, they're, they're, they have they have some. They're not the same. Uh, this is that little rhyme um, that you notice has three different endings. Um, sedges sedges have sharp edges. Rushes are completely uh, cylindrical. Grasses have nodes uh, and or are hollow and or and maybe they will bend. So that's the way to tell the difference between them. But what do they have in common is they are all flowering plants. You know, ferns are not flowering plants. These are, they're angiosperms. But the difference between these and many of the others, not all, is that they are not pollinated by insects. They are, poll they are pollinated by wind. Um, and by the way, that the flower is not called a flower. It's called an inflorescence. Something else about grasses and rushes and sedges is that they're monocot. If you remember from high school biology that when you plant a seed, first what comes up is the cotyledon. That's just the feeder leaf. 
before the true leaves of the plants come up. Well, most plants are dicot. In other words, they'll have two cotyledons, but many are not they're monocots. They just have one, and grasses are in that category. Um, the whole reason for telling you about this distinction is to make the very important point that while dicots grow from their tips, like if you cut them, they'll just branch out more and more and more. Monocots grow from ground level. That's what allows lawn grasses to be mown regularly without being killed. And uh, it also has a lot to do with the uh, emergence of the plants um, in the spring and continuing through the season. Something else about grasses, uh, this is not applied to the sedges and rushes, but most of the grasses native to our region are what's called warm season. They don't emerge in spring until the temperatures reach maybe 55 or better 60, and they die, they turn brown, they die back earlier than the others. Um, looking at this chart, you can see how they're this. The red line, their, their shoot growth is the most during summer, whereas most plants, the cool season grasses and other plants, have their, have their growth in the spring and the fall. I mean, even a rose bush has, has, has growth in the spring and the fall, not as much in the fall. Um, so, um, but grasses are in the category, have, these are warm season grasses that we have around here. Um, The reason, what makes them different is that they have an enzyme that's adapted to hold moisture and tolerate heat. And that's what, that's what gives them that role. Uh, this is the same as cactus. Cactus have the same. We talked about the ecological roles of ferns about the grasses and sedges. They shelter and nest sites, they pollinate insects, birds, and small mammals. They provide construction materials for birds, small mammals, and people. They provide food in the form of seeds for birds and small mammals, and food in the form of grains for people. I mean, really, when you think of grain, you know, corn, rye, wheat, those are all grasses. Um, look at how valuable that is. Many grasses serve as larval host plants for skippers. What does that mean? The adult female will lay eggs on this particular grass uh, so that when the larvae emerge, the caterpillar, they will have the food to eat right there, the food that, that mama knows is, is just what they want and need. There are, what they do is apparently they pull the edges of the grass leaves together and bind them with silk to make a hammock. And then they shelter in it during the day and come out to feed at night. They also will overwinter uh, at caterpillars at the base of the grass clump to emerge in spring and become an adult. Um, there are 120 at least 120 species of butterfly in our own. 39 of them, at least in New Jersey, 39 of them are skippers. They're the little brown jobs. Um, but the patterns of, on the wings are all very different. It's very hard to tell apart. Another ecological role of grasses is to improve the soil. The structure, the fertility, the water retention. Look on the left side of that, and you will see the turf grass um, goes down an inch or so in terms of roots. But some of these others will go down many, many feet. Even and the, the least of which is the little blue stem, and that goes down six feet. So what it does is, you know, these die back in the winter. Um, they contribute to um, 
contribute organic matter, and of course they're improving the porosity of the soil, and they help. Uh, um, and then they decompose easily to um, to form, you know, to, to form new nutrients for growing plants. Uh, also, the the shape of the blade uh, is to capture raindrops and channeling water to the soil, and reducing runoff. Hold the soil. Yeah, very useful ecological. We start with little blue stem. You're seeing it in a field, and then below that, you're seeing uh, this spring uh, where the leftovers from that's also Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. Uh, the leftover, the grasses are looking lovely, really. A uh, little wispy, but uh, the color is, is wonderful. The um, little blue stem will tolerate dry soil, it'll tolerate drought. It'll tolerate wet conditions. In other words, it's it's a very good plant for a, a mix of conditions. And I've made cultivars. These are just two of them. And uh, yeah, uh, Twilight Zone. Uh, that picture was taken in the Delaware Botanic Garden in the meadow made by. Pete Outoff, it's one of his favorite plants, this uh, cultivar of little blue stem. See the, the, the colors in that. And, and by the way, grasses, I meant to say, um, they sort of have two heights. There's the, the basic height when it comes up and puts out the foliage. And then uh, the blossoms will, will add another, sometimes several feet. Grass, another very common plant in this in this region, very dependable, um, tolerates um, also very tolerant of many soil conditions, um, and um, but and it is slightly more shade tolerant than little blue stem. Little blue stem, I can put it in a garden against a against a fence. Uh, put it. Uh, or put it in a garden uh, as a in a uh, a large a large uh, what's the word large planting of it uh, will be will be a nice uh, barrier in a or boundary let's say boundary uh, and will also be fine in among clusters of perennials or even interplanted individually with certain perennials. Same thing with the panicum, the switchgrass, but this is a wider plant, uh, and as I started to say, it won't. It will take a little more shade than the switchgrass, which is really just a sun plant. Another beautiful. Oh, okay, and here we have some cultivars of switchgrass. Uh, that's north wind in the lower left, and that's also north wind right next to it. Shenandoah is one I, I enjoy a lot. Uh, it comes up green, but late summer you start getting these red tinges. You want something blue, there's Dallas Blue. But there are many other cultivars. Prairie dropsy, beautiful plant. Um, look at that the mounding habit over on the right and uh, what it does as it comes into flower on the left and then. Also tolerates dry conditions and drought, uh, but it can also handle wet conditions. It's one of the plants that, that hosts the slippery. You see how this is grown in a mass. It's 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 nice in a mass like that. It's like this is totally. Love grass, pink haze, it's a low growing plant, almost two feet tall, but the, the, the foliage is really only a foot high. Uh, 
um, if you, you know, I like it best when you can be looking over meadow, like in the distance and seeing that pink haze going off into the distance. But um, if you have it in the garden, um, one place not to put it is right along the front because it's a warm season grass. And bear ground until just about this time of year. Side Oaks Grandma. You see how the seeds hang to one side. And this is also a good um, massing plant. Dry in shallow soil, rocky soil, drought tolerant. Again, a good massing plant. This one, another, another blue, blue, blue grandma, blonde ambition. This also picture on the left was taken in the Danville Botanic Garden in Bay by Susan Allen. Planted these seeds with the grass. So it's just a real um, showpiece of a plant. You don't have to grow a big mass of it either, just to have it be a, a few specimens. Northern Seos, Kesmanthian. Shouldn't be that A after the end. Um, you see how the seeds are very obvious on this plant. It makes it very attractive. I will say I am supposed to take a little light shade. I find it flops a little in the shade. Um, in fact, uh, other place I saw some in Brooklyn Bridge Park, um, and then the following year they'd taken it out because it really wasn't. It was flopping too much. But in a sunny or a strong, a, a shady spot that does get some bright sun, it might do fine. Okay. Now we're getting into the sedges, starting with the most commonly known one, which is Carex pennsylvanica, Sylvania sedge. All the sedges that we have around here are Carexes. There are small ones like this one. There are larger ones. And actually, of the small ones, there are many that are about the size of this one that, that, that where the conditions they take are slightly different. Carex pennsylvanica will spread, whereas some others might be just clumpy. Uh, in the lower left, you're seeing, uh, or in the center left, you're seeing a natural area where it's coming up. And I believe those are asters coming up with it. Down below is where somebody tried to make a, an actual lawn out of it. And that can be mowed if you want to make this left like that. I prefer the looser kind of planting with it. And then over at the right, we've got it growing in. This picture taken just a, just a few days ago, really. With um, the, the hardy geranium. And those are buttercups. If you look sort of the top in the center, there's that Japanese autumn fern we talked about earlier growing right next to a tree. And that's last year's foliage you're looking at. Okay. Um, another carex. Um, this one, I put this in because this is for dry shade. If you have a situation where it's, it's always dry and shady, this will uh, kill and maybe even help the soil. Uh, there are two other species very similar, Carex planigenea and uh, Carex lacosperma, uh, that take a little more moisture or have a little bit different conditions. But I find if you've got a dry shade situation, it's just more attractive. Okay, and I'm including one rush. This is Juncus effusus. It uh, you know grows all, along pond edges and it can it can be submerged in water and do fine. Um, if you really 
want to, you can grow it in a garden. People do for that wonderful uh, shape. But uh, it will need moisture, and you're going to have to be careful that it doesn't spread. Now we're here for some more questions. Anthony? All right. So we got a good number of questions. Um, you have the hot topic workshop. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, so I'm gonna, there were a couple more firm questions, but I'm gonna start with the um, grasses ones and then we can go back to the fern questions. Um, so, uh, someone asked for you to just re repeat the enzyme that um, grasses contain. Okay, it's they're called C4 grasses as opposed to C3. The enzyme is a long name, but if you just remember C4, uh, that's what you can look up to find out. And, and like I said, there's C4 plants, all, all the desert plants are, are C4. They're meant, it's meant to, uh, it keep, what happens is the stomata under the leaf flows more readily so that you don't lose moisture. That's what it does. Great. And for everyone, just a reminder that we are recording the webinar and we'll send the, the recording once it's posted. So if you want to rewatch for reference, you definitely can. Um, and we've got nah. out too, which has a lot of what I've said and, and more. Yes. Uh, the next question is, um, do deer like grasses? Okay, well, since I was making this for city gardens, I left out that question too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I can't answer it. I know they like ferns. Um, not sure about grasses. Great. Um, Dallas blues are amazing. How much sun do they need? We have more shade than sun in our garden. Okay, um, trying to remember. Let me go back. Um, well, it does need sun. Uh, it can take a little light shade. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I'm just trying to think if it's because it's blue. Uh, and you want to keep the color, it would probably, it, you probably can't take it much shade at all. Mm. All right, next question. Would prairie drop seed be suitable for people to sit on? No, no, uh, you, you, you'll, it, it's, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll just flatten it. It's just, it's. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, if planting a pollinator, pollinator garden with milkweed and other uh, similar plants, which grass is recommended? Okay, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked. Um, certainly uh, the uh, little blue stem and the uh, switchgrass um, would do very well. You know, uh, milkweed, uh, I'm not sure which milkweed you mean. If you mean the common milkweed, that spreads a lot. So that would be a good mixture, uh, good good to mix in with those grasses. If you're talking about um, the orange um, Cepheus tuberosa, the, the, the butterfly weed, uh, the lower growing ones would be better. I would say uh, the spirobolus, um, and but even um, even some of the carexes, they can take a little sun. Great. Love grass, yeah. Okay, what else? All right. How can we avoid self seeding in open spaces between other plants? Well, the first thing you can do is when the plants flower, when they start to finish flowering, you go back, go around, and you cut off all the seed heads. Um, and uh, the other thing is to uh, see how you can get those bare areas planted with other things. 
they're, you know, they're going to seed in. They're going to seed in. You can't stop them. You have to either eliminate them or, or, or eliminate the, uh, the temptation. Great. All right. So then there, there's a question about um, the best nurseries to find the plants to discuss today. And then the rest of the questions are back to okay. uh, the, the nursery questions is, is very good. Um, um, I would say online, um, if you're looking for ferns, the most uh, prestigious is a place called Fancy Fronds. There are other online nurseries that can send you plugs of plants that are available otherwise only wholesale. Uh, plugs meaning the, um, they're, you know, there may be like a, an inch or two in diameter and then four inches deep, uh, which are excellent, excellent way of planting, especially large quantities of, of a single species. Um, Izel Nursery online uh, is, is one of those. There are a couple of others. Uh, um, sorry, I'll have to uh, get back to you on that. In fact, I can send it around. To, uh, Great. Uh, um, we'll when we follow up with uh, participants afterwards, um, we'll we'll check in with Cindy about um, some of her other nursery recommendations as well. Um, for those green thumb community gardeners who are on here who signed up for our plant distribution, um, some of the plants listed today are part of that distribution um, through the Parks Department's Greenbelt Native Plant Center as well. All right, so then there were a couple questions about ferns. Um, are there any special requirements for maiden hair ferns? I've had trouble with a few in the past. Trouble with maidenhair fern. Um, it, I don't know what the pH of the soil is. That's an issue. Um, it can. It, you might want to um, add lime if it's too. If it's a very low pH soil, um, it does require good drainage. And um, I, uh, I I can't answer that any more um, than that. Um, that That's I, fine. I, trial and error. Try another plant if you can't, or, or, or try try it under different soil conditions in your garden if you can do that, and see where it works best. Um, I I do remember a situation where we were having trouble with maidenhair. Great. Yeah. All right. Um... So I want to make a 50 square foot rain garden with about eight inches change in elevation from bottom to top. Any reference material to point to which ferns to put in? Ooh. I think the question is more, um, where should they put ferns in, within that? Right. Um, well, the question is about reference material. Uh, you say it's 50 square feet and uh, eight inch slope that's that's it, that's pretty deep. Um, the ferns, um, you will not want the largest ferns. You will want, uh, say, the middle distance, uh, midway between the, you know, and it depends on what fern it is, but the, but the middle area as opposed to the upper area and, uh, and the lower area. Now, there's some ferns that can take a lot of moisture, but um, I mean, if you really want, yeah, the uh, the cinnamon fern you could put down in the lower part, uh, um, and um, uh, royal fern, but probably too too big a plant for that site. Great. Mm -hmm. So there are just um, two more questions, um, and then we will wrap things up. Um, so how? Uh, sorry, do ostrich ferns die back in water? Do ostrich ferns die back in water? Uh, no. Uh, well, I mean, how deep is the water is the question. Uh, 
there, you know, you see it on the edge of waters growing, but uh, uh, it, I, it can't be submerged. Um, it, it, it grows in a wetland, but not a, a water, an aquatic situation. Good. Great. And then there was a question about ferns filtering toxins in soil and how long it takes for them to do that. Um, I'm, I would say, I mean, you know, what they, what they do with removing toxins is every year as the toxins are brought up, you cut back the foliage because the, fo the, the toxins go into the foliage and then you find a place to throw out the foliage where the toxins won't be a problem. Um, and it really, it depends, it's too much of it, it depends, it depends on what the, what the toxins are. Um, and uh, of course, you know, they don't go that deep, so you don't know how deep it is, um, it's another issue. Um, uh, and I would say it's, you can't do it in, in one day or one, one season even. If you're really worried about getting toxins out of the soil, uh, you can do it with, better to, to take a more, um, Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so I think that hits uh, all of the questions I have. Okay, well, thank you all very much. And um, all right, well, thank you all for attending. Um, we will email you all afterwards with um, to make sure you have your handouts. Uh, I hope you all stay safe um, and have a good rest of the day. And thank you again for attending. Thank you, everybody.